And I remember at the end of 1990 talking about how we can build that interface between education and industry and enterprise. And we still haven't got it right. So my name is Inge de Waart. I work for, as a learning strategist and innovator for EIT InnoEnergy. And I already commence with contradicting your statement that we are still not there. To my belief, we manage to match education with business and actually create startups from it that we foster all through the way to unicorns. We already have to, and that will probably be a future unicorn as well. And how do we do that? And why is it important that we do that? We do that because we combine those different disciplines and because we in invest in educational tools, but also because we really believe in human capital, like the social sciences, the psychology that were referred to earlier. So I ask the audience now, and then I return the floor to you, Terry. Raise your hands if you have any positive feelings about psychology or social science. <laughs> oh, yes. We're on a good track, people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hall hallelujah, should I be saying that? <laughs> <laughs> Todd, I'll hand over to you. You have to beat that. Oh, I can't beat that. I'm not, gonna try. <laughs> not even going to try. Uh, my name's T Todd Davey. Okay, and rest of the panel like to come in on that one from your experience. What kind of things are you doing? Inga? We, we I can see the enthusiasm. Yes, <laughs> some enthusiasm. So I honestly believe in transdisciplinary. Um, courses or curricula in order to get to where we, we want to well, get with this innovation in educational uh, projects. But I think in, with perspective to future skills, it is very important that you use different pedagogical approaches throughout the universities so that you can also try out new systems which in itself is a meta skill because we all feel we of course we live in universities and we are bound we have boundaries and it's like here they say look the light is there we are going to be recording and you can't stand up which is for all of us because then our heads are above the, the lightning now it's the same in universities they say look you can only do your discipline you can only focus on that one and with transdisciplinarity it's only just started but if we have creative minds like all of us we can come up with solutions very easily one is this as we can then <laughs> walk around and move and still be in the light so I think this can happen in universities as well. We must be trained in change. And if we are trained in change, our minds become more creative and come up with solutions that hasn't or haven't been done yet. That's well, my, mm -hmm. my two From a student perspective, that, that real-world life experience, that real-world scenarios, that's what students, all the research is showing, that's what students are looking for. Inga, you were going to come in there. Yeah, um, so we do have capstone projects and we do have uh, different approaches like challenge-based learning where businesses come, come in and work on solutions that are real-life solutions. All of that is true, but if I think about the time press pressure and the workload and also add to that difficulty the fact that people need to be willing to commit to these new types of um, learning or teaching, then I feel that only having the resources made available is, is not the complete solution. No, definitely not. 
Uh, it needs but incentives as well. So you need to be incentivizing the, the academic population to be doing it, rewarding them in their career path for bringing in these sort of things. Yeah, Does but it, th there's always a limit. You can all, only work that many hours. And if I listen to our students, they also say, look, we have all these wonderful mm -hmm. live labs. We are part of uh, maker spaces. We are part of projects. We move across Europe. But we don't have additional time for anything else. And then I think there's only one solution that is not adding more on top, but taking off some of the pressure, of like yeah. slowing down. It's also, from my perspective, positive for creativity, but I'm looking at Tim. He knows what it's needed for being creative. But I think slowing down and having less would ignite more innovation because you have more time to reflect, more time to talk to people and get a real perspective. So Honestly, we, we've done more innovative stuff and I'm sure, um, Fiedel, you have as well, when you have a long career, you have done all this innovative, innovative stuff and you think you've got it right and then, boom! And, and that was pre-COVID. Imagine what that did, put, putting COVID into the mix has just really s stirred it up completely. But, but that's it. it doesn't matter that it doesn't match. Yeah. If it, it doesn't matter if you are used to dealing with constant change. Then you say, okay, this didn't match purely. This AI tool is really nice, but it only delivers for like 30% of the time. Yeah. But at least because you, are, you can cope with this change and with these challenges, you say, so let's take these 30% and go full out wildcard on the other ones. Yeah. Because in a sense, you can, only, you can never imagine what isn't there. That's, that's the egg of Columbus. Once you see it, it's easy. Once it's not unknown, it's completely complex. But we shouldn't be afraid of it. And that's why I truly believe that learning how to cope with change, learning to just start walking on a rope 10 feet above the ground is OK. Yeah. It's, it doesn't matter. That's and I, and I think that's one of the most important things <laughs> to actually to be able to cope with this very dynamic session, to build partnerships, build collaboration, to work together, is about us all being able and confident in terms of managing change. So if I'm looking at this university, and, and it's embedded in every single discipline, what, what are they doing differently? What are, you know, what are the universities, what, sort of culture exists in this university that's really in, in, you know, responding, bringing students, meeting employability needs, developing all the soft skills, strong partnerships with industry. What, what, what does it look, what are the characteristics of it? If, across not just engineering, but the arts and humanities, the computing, do you know, what, what would it look like? How do they make it? How do we make it happen? Isn't this what we want to happen? It's, it's a growth process because you must believe in the growth process. Yeah. If I look at the Hyperloop project, you, you start off with a, a team that works on the solution that needs to be built. So there's a societal need and a team of students starts to think with uh, their professor, taking it really <laughs> simplifying it. <laughs> And as you pull in the, stake, the business stakeholders, they see how a small project can develop into something bigger. But this is also, it's again, part of human trust and human characteristics. You see that the small thing works, then you say, okay, I'm, maybe I'm willing to sit on the table and start some strategic partnership planning. But at first, you need to build trust. Yeah. And so you have Absolutely. the small groups, but you also have alumni from the different universities growing or coming into leadership positions. They also know that they come from a university that can be trusted or that does good work in this uh, combination. 
And so I think it's a growth process that starts small, and in some cases is already Absolutely. strong it, on yeah. its own, but it, it's a process, so that's... Well. Yeah, I, I agree on that, and that's exactly how we, how we experience it. We started as um, just basically students coming together as a team following our passion of making something happen. We, we got some traction, there were uh, corporate partnerships, involved, uh, eventually also the government got, uh, got involved, so then there was sort of this critical mass of all the required ingredients, right? educational, government, corporate, and then it starts growing and growing, and that's, that's sort of what you need to get towards that, that critical mass. And which skill do you feel that you have that is most critical to support this, go through all this process? Yeah, first of all, where, where we are now is, is like a, a real team effort. So everybody has his own input. And, uh, but what is, um, I think, a great um, example of sort of a personality threat of the, the team players involved is just a relentless drive of getting things done and, and keep on learning. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of things come on your way that you don't expect up front. Uh, but you, you see them and then you try to, to work your way with it. So it's, it's just this continuous drive of, of keep going and try to come up with solutions. Free coffee for anyone who <laughs> comes up with a question. <laughs>, by definition, cannot fit the contemporary requirements of higher education. So they're out of date, and they have to be replaced by a new kind of university, globally connected, more digital, etc. And the comment continues there, we're wasting time trying to fit the future version of higher education into an ancient type of educational establishment. So an open question to all of you would be, where do you see higher education in 20 years' time, ideally? Well, okay. I'll take that one first, if it's okay. Okay. So it's, been a, it's an old discussion in itself. And so at first I thought, yes, universities, clearly higher education institutes do not do the proper job. Now I'm thinking, they, you can't chuck out the baby with the, with the water because we have these structures, we have these very strong, intelligent people on all levels of university who already are pivotal actors in these uh, business networks, business and uh, university partnerships. So I believe we can actually do a change. We will never be able to do the ideal job, but then again, if you look at businesses, they never have an ideal training, learning and development department either. So there is a fundamental distance between ideal situations, being ideally trained, having the ideal background, in what we can do as humans, because we are in a constant change. So I don't believe we need to set up something completely new. I think I agree with Fidel. Gather all the stakeholders, policymakers, educational uh, institutes, businesses, of course, and listen to all the students and create it from there. Social impact, social change, it never happens unless everybody is involved. You can't just say, that one doesn't work, just pff, write it off. You know, you need to be constructive, work with everybody, be open. I think that's a very good place just to, to, to hold for a moment. And I think we've finished on time. Um, I was warned we had to finish on time. I know you had to be a little bit shorter. So can I thank my panel? Thank you very, very much. Uh, can I thank my participants, both here and online? And uh, it's time for coffee, and you get a free coffee. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well Thank done. You.